now it seems that uh, we have Dr. Ben uh, Gortzel here. Um, again, hello everyone, welcome back and hello Dr. Gortzel. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, Bita and I'm a researcher and data scientist at Ryerson University. I'm honored to be your host for this session and introduce one of uh, our greatest speakers, Dr. Ben Gortzel. Uh, during the talk, if you have any question, uh, post it in the chat section. I will make sure that at the end of the talk, we get back to all of them uh, with Dr. Gortzel. Um, Dr. Gortzel is the CEO of the Decentralized AI Network, Singularity Net, a blockchain-based AI platform company and the Chief Science Advisor of Hanson Robotics for, for several years. He led the team developing the AI software for the Sophia robot. A very interesting, he also serves as a chairman of the Artificial General Intelligence Society, the Open Cock Foundation, the Decentralized AI Alliance, and the futurist nonprofit Humanity Plus. He is one of the world's foremost experts in artificial general intelligence which is a subfield of AI oriented toward creating thinking machines with general cognitive capabilities at a human level and beyond. He also has decades of expertise uh, applying AI to practical problems in areas ranging from natural language processing and data mining to robotics, video gaming, national security, and uh, bioinformatics. He has published 20 scientific books and 140 plus scientific research papers. And he's the main architect and designer of the Open Cog system and associated design for human level general intelligence. Uh, without further ado, back to you, Ben. Hey, yeah, uh, thanks for that uh, introduction, and thanks for uh, <coughs> thanks for having me here. So, let's talk about uh, artificial intelligence rather than dysfunctional presentation software. So. It's a long-standing joke that uh, IT is 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 harder than than AI, AI anyway. So, um, what I what I want to talk about uh, today for the next few minutes is some work I've been doing with my team at uh, Singularity Net and some of the other organizations associated with, with Singularity Net on what I I somewhat oxymoronically have come to call narrow AGI. So, you know, I introduced the concept of artificial general intelligence uh, 15 years ago or something to, to focus attention on AI that tries to learn and generalize and, and reason more like a person with some autonomy and agency as opposed to AIs that just solve very narrow problems. And of course, you know, when I introduced that term in 2004, it was very obscure and often a little corner of the AI research world. Now, now it's still sort of off in the corner of the AI research world, but it's a much bigger corner and it, it's better accepted. And you have entities like DeepMind and OpenAI that are pushing toward explicitly toward human level general intelligence and it's a more accepted pursuit now. And, you know, the idea that we could be at human level AGI within say 10 years is no longer completely the province of uh, futurist maniacs and, and science fiction fans. It's at least within the spectrum of, of, you know, seriously acknowledged perspectives. But even if, you know, it, it, it's great we've made this progress there's still a gap between where we are with practical AI systems today, which are what we call narrow AIs carrying out highly specific functions aimed at specific vertical applications versus general intelligence AIs that can really think like people with you know, ab ab abstraction and, and their own sense of uh, agency and, and so forth. And, you know, one, it's not obvious how that gap will be bridged, right? It, it could be possible some, you know, some research project in self-modifying uh, automated program learning or something just makes AGI pop up all of, all of a sudden. On the other hand, it could be there's more of a gradual incremental process of getting from their AI toward AGI, and that's sort of the, 
hypothesis I'm going to explore here. What I mean by a narrow AGI is a system that can display greater and greater levels and degrees of, of general intelligence, but with its intelligence initially focused in some specific area. So you could have a narrow AGI, which is really good at, you know, controlling robots or one that's really good at biomedical research. And it can get better and better at generalization and abstraction and doing multiple tasks and so forth, but still not general across all the tasks that, that human beings can do. So I think one possible path from narrow AI to true AGI is through a series of narrow AGI systems that manifest greater and greater levels of, of AGI in, in particular vertical areas. And then these narrow AGIs may in themselves, I mean, they may merge to form a sort of integrated uh, human level AGI. Uh, actually. And what I'm gonna talk about now is some work on sort of vertical application specific narrow AGI systems using in particular an approach of neural symbolic integration and to me neural symbolic integration is just sort of the baby steps version of, of hybrid AGI architecture so I mean uh, I, I think uh, ultimately the best route to get to AGI using the currently available palliative technologies will be to build hybrid systems that integrate say neural networks with logic systems with evolutionary learning systems with episodic memory systems and the, there's a whole bunch of things you want to integrate together one step in that direction is integrating neural nets with symbolic reasoning systems which is what i'm gonna talk a bit about here i'm not i'm not gonna actually go through everything on this slide for lack of time but i'm gonna show a little bit of visual scene understanding a little bit about uh, genomics and then talk a bit about, about how to get further toward fully ambitious uh, AGI, which we're doing with, 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 with the true AGI project. So let me talk momentarily about visual question answering first. And I mean, that, so showing a, a computer videos or pictures and asking questions about what's happening there, this is something that's been done with a pure neural net approach, but there's also something that you can add with this symbolic approach. So here, let's say you look at this image, you have a question, what shape is a large metallic object? Now, what we've been doing is we use a neural net to recognize, you know, what things are large, what things are shapes, what, what, what things are metallic looking and, and so forth. So if you then ask what shape is a large metallic object, you can then have a structured logic query and you can search your logical knowledge base, which in this case is in the in the OpenCog system. You can search your, your logical knowledge base to find an image or a subset of an image that has a large metallic object and then answer something about, about the shape, like it's cylindrical or something. So here, using the neural net to recognize objects and properties of objects, and then you're connecting the different objects and properties using using a logic system. So similarly, you want to know what what color is the plane. Well, recognizing colors and recognizing planes can be done separately by neural nets, and and then you can you can piece those together using a logic system. And we've we've actually done something real that's uh, deployed like this with Cisco for for tracking objects like cars or or, or people. So you use neural nets to recognize cars and people and bicycles in the street. And then you want to recognize, say, tra traffic jam or, uh, you know, an, an injured person in the street or an accident or something, recognize these higher level properties. We do that using a logic-based query acting on, on the, the percepts, the low level percepts that were made by, by a neural net system. So in pedestrian analytics, for example, if you have images of a whole bunch of people walking around, you might have the question like, are these two or three people part of a family group or are they just people who randomly happen to be walking next to each other? And you, you can answer that using using logical inference based on predicates like, you know, are, did people arrive together? Did people leave together? Are they standing up and looking at predicates regarding time series of relationships, concepts like waiting, family meeting and, and so forth? 
you that you then have have some rules which can be mined from data like if you have a child and they arrive with someone else it's almost it's almost certain that's that's a family or you know if two people arrive together and they're together now for a while they're probably going to leave together so you can mine logical rules like this from data then these logical rules can be deployed within within the logic engine to make inferences regarding uh regarding what's what's happening in the in individual scene and you can you can you can then get uh one shot predictions like you watch it you watch people coming into a scene and you can predict predict what they're going to do afterwards and this this uses neural nets with low level perceptions and then logical pattern mining and, and inference to understand the higher level higher level relationship so this is this is one way to use neural symbolic systems in a sort of hybrid context to to do some stuff that neural net and the symbolic engine are going to do together and the symbolic reasoning here is inside the opencog system which integrates a bunch of different ai algorithms on a common weighted labeled hypergraph knowledge base and uh the neural neural nets are fairly standard uh, trained neural models trained in, in in torch but there's some subtlety to the interoperation between the neural models and the opencog symbolic network like you have a node in the open code symbolic network corresponding to uh say a, a layer of, of a neural model and then the composition of layers or neural networks into a neural architecture is mirrored by the composition of nodes inside the open cog knowledge hypergraph so you need to get a sort of morphism relating the structure between neural substructures and the corresponding nodes in, in the symbolic network but i mean it all it, 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 it all works and you can you can do transfer learning i mean you can learn rules in one video about say what makes people leave together from the place being observed and you can you can transfer knowledge from one 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 video to to another video so now i want to switch to a quite different sort of example here which is not in the vein of video analysis but in in, in the vein of of DNA analysis, actually. So what what we're doing here, we're trying to understand why some people live a long time and others don't by looking at their DNA. And we've done similar work in precision medicine, like understand why some people are why their breast cancer is cured by one drug when someone else with breast cancer it's not cured by that by that that same drug. For 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 example, so here we're we're trying to understand the causes and 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 reasons behind different so, sort of phenotypic aspects of a, of a human organism and and we have what we call the bio atom space which is a huge combination of knowledge gotten from structured bioontologies from analyzing various genomic and proteomic data sets from extracting knowledge from research papers all this is is integrated together into a a knowledge hypergraph in in opencog which has different types of nodes and links summarizing the the biological knowledge and you can then do reasoning on this biological knowledge graph you can mine patterns and in this case what we're doing is we're using this knowledge hypergraph and then we're getting neural embedding vectors from it using graph embedding methods so if you have say a knowledge hypergraph with a huge amount of biological knowledge in it and then you have nodes in that hypergraph representing people so you may have a node for a node for Ben Goetzel in, in, in that in that hypergraph, a node for Joshua Bengio in that knowledge hypergraph. The Ben Goetzel node is linked to all sorts of information about Ben's genome and proteome and clinical medicine indicators. If you then want to do some classification to predict like which, which people are going to live a long time or which people are susceptible to a cure by some medicine, you may want to use a supervised learning algorithm to classify those people. So what you can do. You can use this knowledge graph with symbolic reasoning algorithms to figure out things about the people. Then you can use graph embedding methods to make an embedding vector for for each person, and then you feed those embedding vectors into into supervised learning algorithms. So here, here, so in, in the in the in the other application with traffic, we were using neural nets to recognize visual features as a pre-processing layer for symbolic reasoning system to make judgments about people's movements. 
in this genomics case, one thing we're doing, we're using a symbolic system to integrate various kinds of knowledge about people. Then we're using graph embedding to spit out vectors that sort of bake in that that's that symbolic knowledge about the people and those vectors can then be be fed into machine learning algorithms and we've used deep walk graph convolutional networks and then some uh, kernel pca based methods to do the to do the 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 embedding so as one example of the concrete stuff that, that motivates this so we have a logic engine that can do reasoning based on integration of a bunch of knowledge to sort of figure out like why why certain gene figure out which genes correspond to longevity and 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 why and this this is 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 quite interesting so like the logic engine it, it tries to figure out say the gene itpr3 is overexpressed in healthy old people and figure out why this is expressed in, in healthy so you're doing a bunch of reasoning about which genes correspond with which phenotypes like longevity and this is building out more and more nodes and links in this in this knowledge hypergraph so then if you want to use a knowledge hypergraph that's built up by this sort of inference to do embeddings you can use a number of, of approaches i mean deep walk is one what deep walk does is sort of if you have a knowledge graph it makes a whole bunch of random walks through that knowledge graph and it treats each random walk sort of like a sentence for word to vector or something. And so then based on that, it, make, it makes vector embeddings of, of the nodes in the graph. So you can get, in, in this case, after you had a knowledge graph, do reasoning about people and genes and, and phenotypes and biological processes, you can then make an embedding vector for a person or a gene that bakes in a lot of the knowledge about the relationships connect, connected with that person or gene in, 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 in the knowledge graph. We've actually looked at a number of different methods of mapping what we call the, the atom space, which is this weighted labeled knowledge hypergraph that, that, that we're working with in OpenCog. You can use deep walk, you can use graph convolutional networks. So far, so far the best thing we actually found is a little more old style, which is kernel principal component analysis. So there, what you do, you do a lot of symbolic reasoning on the knowledge graph so that say all the key all the key properties of say the Ben Gertzel node or the gene FKH1 node, all the key properties of a node in the knowledge graph, after the reasoning, they're represented as links representing logical predicates and, and relationships connected to that node for Ben Gertzel or, or, or the gene FKH1. And then you have a bunch of links coming out of the Ben Gertzel node, say, and you, you treat that collection of weighted links as a sparse property vector then you dimension reduce it using kernel PCA and you pick you pick a, a kernel inspired by your logical inference method so that say two two logical relations that are judged similar by the logical inference method you want you want you want them to be judged similar in the embedding vector space also so by by adjusting the kernel in kernel PCA you can get embeddings that actually work better than with deep walk or, 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 or GCN. And we, one way that we measure this, you like look at you look at the logical difference, the logical similarity or difference between two nodes in the atom space, which is in the horizontal axis. Then you can look at the vector distance between corresponding embedding vectors. This graph is for gene ontology category nodes representing a biological process, like say. A, 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 apoptosis or mitosis or something, but I mean the same type of graph can be made for nodes representing people or, or genes. And yeah, you, you find a sort of okay correlation between the distances between nodes in the logic system in the atom space and the distances between the corresponding embedding vectors. Now, in a different domain, this, this isn't this isn't biology. This is from analysis of student behaviors in the online education system, you get a much nicer correlation between the distances in the vector embedding space and, and in, the, in the logic space. I mean, because biology is a mess, right? So in a very clean domain, you can do embeddings that really preserve distances in a beautiful way. In biology, there's still sort of a preservation, preservation of, of distances. And then you can also get vector arithmetic to work. You know, like, so in, in word to vec you have things like man versus woman equals king minus queen, right? So if you take the embedding vectors for the words king, queen, man, and woman, and 
look at the vector subtraction. You get king king vector minus queen vector roughly is equal to man vector minus woman vector. So we we can we can get the same thing here, like the vector for say the process of B cell differentiation minus the vector for the process of T cell differentiation is roughly equal as a vector to the vector for B cell proliferation minus the vector for T cell proliferation. So and you can get the same thing with vectors for individual genes or, or medical patients or something. So we're we're embedding nodes in the knowledge graph into vectors. We're getting correlation of distances between the nodes in the logical knowledge graph and the distance between the embedding vectors. And we're getting, you know, logical fuzzy set relationships to correspond with vector difference relationships, which is 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 quite interesting actually and then so i mean we formalize this in terms of of category theory you're having morphisms between the vector algebra and then the the sort of fuzzy logic algebra on on the on the knowledge graph side and we then use this to guide reasoning which is which is quite interesting so if if, if you're trying to do reasoning you figure out like you know why does why does overexpression of genes in the itf3 gene ontology category what, 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 why does that overexpression tend to lead to to longevity? You know, if you want to understand that using logical reasoning, you want to avoid the total explosion in your logical reasoning process. So then, what you can do, you can take the embedding vector corresponding to your premises, like overexpression of gene ITF3. You can take an embedding corresponding to your conclusion, like, well, this person's going to live a long time. And then to help guide the inference in the right way, you can look at midpoints between the embedding vectors of the premises and conclusion in the vector space. You can find nodes and links in your atom space that correspond to the midpoint between those embedding vectors and use that as potential sort of a in, in, intermediate uh, conclusions. So that's uh, you, using the using the uh embedding space to sort of guide the direction of of logical inference to cut through commentarial explosions in inference so this is sort of full circle right so like in, in this application you start with a knowledge graph with a bunch of biology knowledge in it you make embedding vectors of the nodes in the knowledge graph then you can use those embedding vectors as input to machine learning, like classification or clustering algorithms, but you can also use the embedding vectors to guide logical inference in 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 the knowledge graph, because you can look at the the vector pointing from the premises to the conclusion and decide intermediate points along that vector may be useful as sort of intermediate logical goals for the inference engine going from premises to to conclusion. So I, I mean that's a uh, quite i mean it's fairly subtle and it's uh it's multiple multiple kinds of logical inference and symbolic reasoning together with multiple uses of of, of neural networks i mean i mean it's not uh not as simple as taking a neural net and pipe it into a symbolic system you, you really have to think about what we're doing and now these so these two particular applications i've described they they fit into a into a into a bigger picture, which is uh, the new version of the OpenCog AGI framework, which we're we're wrapping into an application framework that that we call uh, we call true true AGI. And give me one moment. I'm I'm being interrupted for five seconds, and, and then then I'll come back. <laughs> All right, I'm I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, so the yeah the the OpenCog Atom Space, which is the knowledge hypergraph I keep referencing, 
is where we're integrating neural and symbolic methods and then also evolutionary and other methods and the applications that I just alluded to. So we're now in the midst of rebuilding the OpenCog engine, which has been around more than a decade now, making a new system called OpenCog <coughs> Hyperon and embedding this in a, a whole application framework. And there's there's a whole bunch of, of pieces here. I can't go over too much of it now, but I'd encourage you. Uh, we had a, <coughs> an online conference called the OpenCog Con uh, earlier earlier this year. You can find a bunch of this there. And there's there's a page on the OpenCog Wiki site on Open Hyperon. But I mean, what we're doing here, we're, we're rebuilding the OpenCog Atom Space this sort of neural symbolic wood labeled hypergraph knowledge store we're rebuilding this to run uh, efficiently across a huge number of different machines we're developing a new sort of a dependently typed uh, probabilistic functional programming language called uh, atomies 2 which works natively with this knowledge graph which uh, We've been using Scheme as a sort of scripting language on OpenCog so far, which is cool, but we finally come to the point that we, we want like a custom, like custom language, which is optimized for what we're doing. And then within this custom language operating on this scalable knowledge hypergraph, I mean, then, then we're wrapping up neural learning, probabilistic reasoning, probabilistic programming, evolutionary learning, and, and so forth and referencing external libraries like a, a torch and and uh, say a sat solver as 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 needed sort of referenced as sort of uh monads in this in this functional programming language uh atomies too so we're what we're aiming at doing here is just making making these sorts of experiments i've been describing regarding say computer vision and, and biology making them a lot slicker like Right now, working with something like Keras or TensorFlow is very slick and simple and easy to make shit work. And uh, I mean, working with neural symbolic methods in OpenCog, as I've been describing, I mean, we're doing it, but it's a lot more awkward and, and, and laborious, right? So we're, we're, we're look, looking here at how to, how to make it just a lot easier to experiment with these types of, of algorithms. And at the same time, looking at making it much, much more scalable. And I mean, this is where the work I've been doing on SingularityNet, which is a blockchain-based AI platform you can find out about in singularitynet.io. I mean, this, this lets us massively scale up AI systems in a decentralized way, running across many, many different computer networks. And, you know, we need that to make the distributed atom space the distributed knowledge store work, work work the way it wants to so there's a lot of different pieces here but i mean i think what you know what we we saw from like 2014 to 2017 or so you saw computer vision go through a massive acceleration and you saw you've been seeing the same thing with nlp since BERT, like 2018 till this year nlp has just been going so fast game plan so accelerated very, very fast over a few years with a sort of threshold, right? So I'm thinking that OpenCog Hyperon wrapped in true AGI application architecture built on SingularityNet platform. I mean, I think I'm hoping as we roll this out over the next couple of years, this can help catalyze a similar, you know, threshold like uh, acceleration in, in, in progress on, on AGI where these sorts of neural symbolic experiments like I've been discussing become the mainstream. And we see incredibly rapid progress in this domain, like we're seeing now in, in computer vision and, and NLP. And I think I will, I will, I will uh, stop there. Maybe I can take a minute or two and answer a couple of the questions that I see have popped up. Uh, someone asked about, Alpha Zero and Alpha Go and AGI. I mean, I think, you know, I, I've I've said uh, 
GPT-3 has about as much to do with AGI as, as my toaster. I mean, I think Alpha Zero has a little more to do with, with AGI than, than a toaster, right? I mean, I mean, at least, at least Alpha Zero is doing some generalization, right? I mean, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's figuring out patterns about a game it's not heard of before. Now, I don't think Alpha Zero represents things abstractly enough that it could like, I don't think it could take anything learned about Othello and translate it to Go, for example. I think it's doing more particular knowledge representation than that. And in that sense, I think it's sort of not doing the right thing. Like Alpha Alpha Zero is cool, much cooler than Alpha Go, right? Because I mean, Alpha Zero could sort of learn any game within certain parameters, but I don't think its internal representation supports robust transfer learning about general strategic principles or, or something. So, I mean, I think in, in a way, it's still not learning in a way that, su that supports or is driven toward abstract knowledge representation. And because of that, it's not going to be doing general intelligence in the, in, in, the way we need to to move toward toward human level AGI. I I mean I'd be very proud if I'd coded it though. It's very it's very cool. So any any other uh, quick questions uh, popping up? Thank you, thank you so much, Ben. Um, I really talk and. I think we all agree that um, AGI and neural uh, symbolic methods are uh, uh, one of the uh, most interesting subjects uh, in AI. And um, now um, to the questions, uh, what would be a definition of uh, human level AGI? Well, I don't think that's not precisely defined and I don't think that's necessarily a problem. Like as I've often said, like biologists don't have a definition of 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 life, and they don't obsess on it too much. And you have stuff like viruses that are retroviruses are kind of alive or not, and and whatever. Those are just borderline cases, right? So, but I, I mean, I think the Turing test of being able to copy a person in a brief conversation and trick people into thinking you're human. I think it's clear that's no longer a good test for AGI. Like Turing just wasn't thinking about, you know, like the the amount of data that a Facebook or a Google has accumulated of human conversations or something. I mean I mean I, I think I I think uh, we're gonna be able to pass the Turing test by cheating using uh transformer neural nets and the massive massive data that we've gotten and it, it sort of doesn't matter it doesn't necessarily get us anywhere i i i think having having a, a robot that could graduate mit going through exactly all the steps so that, that a, a human student does would be would be more interesting because getting a degree from a good university it's sort of intended as a test of intelligence and, and learning and so forth whereas holding a conversation Holding a conversation uh, is it isn't. But I mean, there there is someone in chat. If you don't have a definition, what would be the goal or, or 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 direction? I mean, I mean, I think to be there is a formal definition of general intelligence. Marcus Hooter has proposed one in in his book Universal AI, and I published a number of papers on it. So. The problem isn't actually in formally defining general intelligence, which can be done using algorithmic information theory and statistical decision theory. The problem is in defining human level because a human is a mess, and we don't we don't have a formalization of what is human, right? So I mean, I mean, we also also say if someone is trying to define like a, a, a if if someone's trying to build a, a useful home service robot. We don't have a formal mathematical definition of what's a useful home home service robot. We don't, we don't have a formal definition of what's a phone or a laptop either, and, and we're able to build those things. So, I mean, I think 
in the human world, we don't need formal definitions of of everything in order to in order to to build them. I, I mean, that, that's uh, it's pretty clear to me. If you could build an AGI that could do every job that humans now do in the economy better than better than people, ninety nine percent of them. I mean, that's that's not a bulletproof formal definition like Marcus Hooter's general definition of general intelligence, but I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's good enough. And it's, it's sort of what you're working toward in, in, in practice, right? Just for economic, economic reasons, you, you businesses want every job function to be done better and cheaper. So you're working toward AGIs that can, AIs that can take over every, every human job. And if you have one system that can learn to do every human job, with the same or less training that the new ones have to do it that's a pretty good practical system yeah someone's asking about young lacune's idea there's no such thing as agi because human intelligence is nowhere near general i mean i mean with, with all due respect that's just an in, incredibly stupid statement uh, i mean there there's a mathematical theory of, of agi which young lacune may or may not know about but there's loads of published papers on it and and th there are there are folks who have worked at Facebook AI labs who know that literature very well, even if Jan doesn't. So th there is there is such a thing as, as general intelligence. I mean, there's a formal definition of general in intelligence. Absolutely, totally general intelligence is only achievable by infinitely powerful computer systems, which which don't exist. But there's a formal notion of approximating general intelligence, and humans are not the most generally intelligent system that there is. Uh, absolutely true, and I think we can make AGIs that are much more generally intelligent than humans. But unless they're infinitely powerful, they're not going to get to total general intelligence, and that's that's okay. I mean, formalizing exactly what is human level is is hard, and sort of sort of doesn't doesn't matter as, as as far as i could tell so yeah i see we're getting a lot of questions in the general concept of agi which is a an easy thing to philosophize and, and think about and it, it's it's cool and and uh, and and fun I, I guess those of us in the agi field are more interested in like pragmatically designing and building systems that go closer and closer to AGI rather than in sort of pontificating about what is AGI or is it possible or not. I mean, sort of like in synthetic biology, the researchers are more concerned with making more and more capable molecular systems rather than with pontificating about is a synthetic biology system really alive or where exactly is the border between life and non-life? Yes, I completely agree. Whenever we uh, talk about uh, AGI, um, usually the first um, questions that come up are uh, questions related to the, the philosophy of uh, AGI. No, and it's cool. We all like to think. All like to think about that, and just like the philosophy of life is cool, and I mean, yeah, the philosophy of literature is cool too. But then people keep writing great novels, even though we don't have a theory of what great literature is so i mean the, not that the theory is, is 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 bad but i think we don't generally need to resolve all theory questions before building the systems i mean often building the systems help helps to 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 guide guide the theory right and and, and there's some feedback between those two aspects yeah well whenever attendees phrase it very well uh david said it's a journey not a destination i completely agree and um, um, thank you so much, Ben. Uh, do you want to um, add uh, anything else? Um, I think uh, there's a lot to add, but there's almost too much to add. So all, all, all I will do is uh, I will encourage people to uh, take a look at so on the Singularity Net blog, singularitynet.io. There's a bunch of stuff that's not just about the blockchain-based platform, but a bunch of our work in neural symbolic AI and so forth. There's a link from there. And uh, if you look on YouTube, uh, SingularityNet channel, you can find the OpenCogCon 
and then the AGI 2020 conference, uh, like online conferences and following up papers and so forth from there will uh, give you some clues to poke into the modern AGI, AGI field a bit. So uh, we're certainly uh, always interested to recruit more, more people to help out uh, building AGI systems on OpenCOG or SingularityNet. And there's other open source AGI projects like Open NARS and so forth which are, are also, you know, actively recruiting uh, collaborators. So if you, that's, Yeah, that's great. And um, just a question uh, came up. Um, where are the limits of vector embeddings? For example, quantum mechanics is based on a statistics that makes use of complex matrices, allowing the richer landscape. Uh, so uh, where are the limits of, of vector embeddings? Well, I mean, you, the... The limits are clear in, in a sense. I mean, it's the algebra of real vector space. And I mean, the, if you want to project a knowledge hypergraph into a real vector space, I mean, you're losing some structure and you're preserving some structure, right? And so, I mean, that's a, that, that's, that's sort of an in, intentional thing. By getting rid of some structure, you're simplifying operations, like finding what's between two things or finding what's in the vicinity of two things. And then, but you can't do logical inference anymore. So I mean, there, there could be a role for embedding into a, a complex vector space, which becomes more quantum-like. And I mean, the, then you then then you're you're losing some things and gaining some things relative to a, re, a real vector space. So I mean, I think I think about it more in sort of category theory terms, in terms of morphisms. Like you you want to map your knowledge into a bunch of different forms, depending on what what you want to do with them. And so, I, I mean, I, I don't think vectors is the best form for everything. I wouldn't be working with these knowledge hypergraphs. But I mean, vectors are great for for some of operations. And what, what, what we want to use, in what cases you want to use a quantum theory type representation inside a system run on a classical computer that's a subtler question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, we're not seeing a use case for that right now, but there, there might be one. Of course, if, if you have a quantum computer, you could do a lot of other cool things, but that, that's, uh, we don't have uh, enough qubits yet to, for quantum computing to be really useful for the sorts of AI that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ben. Um, this has been a really great talk. And um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and um, I hope that I can um, see you again in other talks. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you.